Hello, you are listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer and Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to learn even more about how you can be healthy naturally. Now, our guest today is Jane Lindsay. Jane lives and works in Australia. She is a homeopath. She works with flower essences and NES Health, and she is a spokesman for Your Health, Your Choice campaign in Australia. You can find out more about her and her work at janelindsay.com.au and yourhealthychoice.com.au. Welcome, Jane Lindsay. Thank you, Catherine. It's great to be with you. Now, Jane, what exactly is homeopathy? Sometimes I think we think we know, but, you know, maybe we don't. What is it, actually? Yeah, there's a lot of confusion out there. And certainly in Australia, I expected people to, to be very sort of the land of the free and natural health. But actually, homeopathy is greatly misunderstood. Homeopathy comes from the Greek words homeo and pathos. Homeo meaning um, uh, similar and pathos meaning suffering. So the first principle of homeopathic medicine is like curing like. So for example, if you were sneezing and had runny nose, runny eyes, maybe an allergic rhinitis, a, a, a hay fever episode going on right now, and we were, um, you know, we were together, I might give you a rem remedy based um, from a substance called allium sepia. Allium sepia is a red onion. If we weren't virtual and I cut a red onion here and now and you weren't wearing glasses, your eyes would lacrimate. So in potency, this substance has the possibility to bring about cure when there are those symptoms happening. Another example that perhaps is um, also easy to, to illustrate this point of like curing like is um, Ipecuana. This is used in hospitals to induce vomiting. It's an emanetic. Um, if you had travel sickness, morning sickness, or in fact any kind of nausea and sickness, Ipecuana is one of the remedies that may be useful in, in, in helping um, get rid of that, that, that sickness and that nausea. Do you drink coffee, Catherine? No, I, I'm not a, a coffee drinker. I'm actually a green tea drinker. <laughs> Excellent. I just asked the question because why do people drink coffee? Why do some people drink coffee? Any reasons? Uh, to get more energy. To get more energy, absolutely. It can hype them up and stimulate. So in a person or a child perhaps who's overstimulated, overexcited at the end of a, you know, a busy day or a party or is anticipating Santa coming down the chimney and the child just will not go to sleep and cannot relax, coffee in potency has the possibility of bringing that child's energy system into balance so they can fall asleep. It works for adults too, of course. So that's the first principle, like curing like. The second principle is we use the smallest amount of medicine to bring about cure. So unlike when you go to the doctors, you may get a course of antibiotics that last 10 or 14 days. With homeopathy, generally, the prescription is, 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 is for less frequency, um, and they come in very small globules or drops, which surprises many of my patients. They say, really? Is that it? One remedy? You have to be kidding. But they then come back two or three weeks later and they say, wow, I never had any idea about the power, the possibility and the potency of, of homeopathic medicine. And we work on an individual basis. So say I have a children's clinic, seven or eight kids, one in the same day, all with eczema. It looks the same. It's in the same places, the creases, the back of the neck, the back of the knees. Each child may get a different remedy based on their individual susceptibility and their individual symptom picture. So one child walking in might bound into my office, pull out all the books and the toys, leap off the sofa, bang the drum, throw the whatevers. The other child might come in behind the, the mother's knees and, and skirts and hide. And it might take them 15 minutes to be confident enough to peep out from behind their mother and just see and take a rain check on, on who's there. So the personality of the child is important. 
but also their likes and, and um, dislikes and preferences for food, whether they're thirsty or not, how they sleep, um, if they sleep, if they're restless, if they sleep on their bottom or their tummy. Um, there are many, many, many factors that we take into account. So, you know, there isn't one remedy for eczema. We have over seven and a half thousand remedies in our homeopathic materia medica. So identifying the correct remedy for that child or for that individual is paramount to, 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 to their being successful prescribing and in effectiveness. And so the homeopath has to be very skilled and very practiced in that. Now, how does homeopathy differ from other forms of alternative medicine, Jean? That's a really good question, Catherine. Um, I often get compared to a naturopath. Now, naturopaths, I work with many, natu many great naturopaths, and I know that's part of your background. And I do presc prescribe um, supplementation when required. Homeopathy works on this individual susceptibility to disease. So we look at the totality of symptoms presenting, we look at the individual family health history, and we work with, if you like, the energy and vitality of the individual. In some medicines, this is called prana, in other medicines, it's called chi. In homeopathy, Hahnemann, Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, who's the founder of homeopathic medicine, he refers to the vital force, and the vital force um, is really what communicates with us as physicians and creates symptoms in the patient that we can then identify and work with. So the difference between homeopathy and other forms of alternative and complementary medicine is really that we do work with um, very much with the individual. We work with this minimum dose concept. So we don't have to be taking something every day for the rest of our lives. Often supplementation might mean um, without homeopathy, that the body is deficient of that and it, it never quite catches up with itself. We have the possibility to make that change and make it permanent, be it a physical one, be it an emotional one. We deal with a lot of post-traumatic stress disorders in children, in adults, in soldiers coming back from the war. Um, and so it's, it's a total prescription. It's not one remedy for a bruise, one remedy for a headache. We look at the whole. I have patients coming with children with a diagnosis of ADHD, which is very much on, on the increase. And they just want their child to be able to sit still and concentrate. But in, in, in giving that prescription, they find their child sleeps better, not only communicates better and answers, and, but their appetite improves, that their, their thirst changes, that their communication at all levels improves not just the ability to sit still in class, which I personally believe for many six and seven year olds is totally unnatural, but that's another story <laughs> and not why we're here today. Now, Jane, Lindsay, um, you've been a long-term homeopath, yes. um, a many years standing. In your professional opinion, what makes a good homeopath? Mm. What makes a good homeopath? Well, there, there's a, a, a big skill set um, required to be a homeopath, but I guess the, the driver for many of us is, is a passion to assist others in achieving good um, and maintaining great health, correcting some of the imbalances that we have in our you know, systems that we've picked up through life or through the environment. But it is also about an innate curiosity um, about what makes people tick. And that means that every case and every day is a joy and delight for me because every patient is different in how they present and the issues and problems they come with. We have to be um, good listeners. We have to be able to empathize and listen and listen really well. Sometimes during an hour and a half consultation, I may only ask three questions of the patient, three questions, and I listen and I listen intently. Sometimes I have to ask a lot more. It depends how talkative they are, how much they, they, they can share easily, um, and, and, and how much um, you know, more questioning and probing that they need. So the listening is important. Being able to empathize, having a good grounding and a very solid grounding in homeopathic philosophy and its methodologies is absolutely paramount. Um, you, cannot, you cannot go on a weekend course and learn to be a homeopathic practitioner. You can go on a weekend course and learn to prescribe very safely and very accurately 
for everyday illnesses and acutes in the home. Um, but to go on a weekend course and to think that you can tackle sort of cases that have had eczema or asthma for 10 or 12 years um, really is, 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 it's not safe and um, it's not appropriate. And there are many, many good colleges. I trained at the Welsh School of Homeopathy in South Wales, where we were um, very fortunate to have many, many visiting lecturers from around the world, um, including American homeopaths and European homeopaths. And that meant we had a variety of teaching styles and experiences on which to draw and to, to carve our own niche and our own particular style and methodology of practice. But at the same time, really grounding ourselves in those fundamental and core principles. Um, so, so that's really important. And a background of anatomy and physiology is also really, really um, important. Many people do, do a, you know, a foundation course in nursing or they will attend a technical college. I also did my postgrad studies in India, um, in Calcutta where we worked in the slum clinics and we also had the privilege of working in hospitals alongside regular medical physicians who were also homeopaths whose first choice of medicine was homeopathy. Um, and it's about being very open-minded and, and willing to learn and willing to explore. For me, it was a curiosity. My son had um, eczema head to toe when he was about four months old. Mm. It wasn't getting better. The doctor's only answer was to prescribe um, mild steroids, which I mixed with a, a natural cream at the time. It was just getting worse and worse. Three or four months later, a friend of mine said, Jane, go and see a homeopath. I said, what path? What's that? Um, she explained, it didn't resonate for me. I waited another two months until my son was in permanent um, pain and agony. And mm -hmm. I was becoming a very, very distressed first time mother. I went to see a homeopath. She spent an hour and a half asking not just about my son, but about me and my birthing experience, my health history, my mother's health history. At the end of it, she gave me three pills. And I said, is that it? You have to be joking. Three white pills are going to sort this out. I was an angry, irate, frustrated, sleep deprived mother. And you know what? Within four or five days, the skin was really significantly different. I went back a week later for another prescription and then a month later and within six, eight weeks, the skin was completely clear, totally clear. It was like a miracle before my eyes. And I, you know, I said to my husband, is this magic? Is this medicine? What is this stuff? How does it work? And he just said, I have no idea. Go and find out, dear. <laughs> and so that's what I did. And 23 years later, I'm still like Alice through the looking glass down the rabbit warren um, there are so many facets to, to homeopathy um, and to people and humanity that, that keep me um, totally um, yeah, enthralled with our art and our science that is homeopathic medicine. Now, through the miracle of modern technology, you're in Brisbane, Australia. I'm in the Atlanta, Georgia in the U.S., and we're mm. having this conversation, hopefully uplifting and enlightening people all over the world. Now, I, and we hear little kids in the background. Oh. So, <laughs> so one of the questions some people would ask is homeopathy safe for children? Because you, you talked about how you gave this to your baby. And it yes. Helped. Yeah. Homeopathy is totally safe, totally effective. Um, and children love homeopathic medicine. Uh, it tastes great. I have children from all over the world here in, in Brisbane. Um, that take the medicine and in each language there is a different word from lecker to this um, I'm trying to think of the other words that describe and basically it means delicious it means sweet it means a treat um, yummy, and, they yummy. Come and they can't wait give me give me give me I want more I want more um, so they love it but but the question is you know is it suited to the treatment of childhood illness absolutely wholeheartedly um, I can advocate yes and there's a lot of research going on um, and the homeopathic research institute actually catalogs much of this now but here in Australia we have the Aurum project which is a foundation for children and children's health run by a group of homeopaths in Sydney and they have specialized in looking at acute otis um, media and um, 
and recurrent otitis in the ears. And yes, I'm afraid the children are not mine. They are a neighbor's. I'm not able to quieten them at this point. Anyway, it's, it's a public holiday here, so they're not at school. Um, so children's health. We see an overprescription of antibiotics globally. We see global antibiotic resistance. Australia is one of the worst cul culprits. Um, there is an alternative and homeopathic medicines can be exceptionally helpful at not only reducing the acute pain and inflammation, but in the prevention of ongoing and recurrent ear infections. Quite often a child will receive, even, you know, for a sore throat or for, for ears, a, a, a prescription of antibiotics. And within a month, six weeks, the infection's back. So all we're doing is putting a Band-Aid on and a Band-Aid and a Band-Aid and a Band-Aid. And what that may cause long-term um, are hearing issues and, uh, and other long-term effects, let alone the effect of the antibiotics on the gut biome. And you know, everybody now is, is aware of how significant the gut biome is to our overall health and immunity. And antibiotics, we know, kill off the bad things, but they kill off the good things as well. That's putting it obviously very simply. So a child that's immune system isn't fully yet developed is receiving, you know, re repetitive antibiotics. Homeopathy comes in, works alongside or instead of, and the child gets fitter, gets healthier, gets stronger, and is less susceptible to those winter um, infections that happen. We're just coming into winter here, uh, and this is the time of year where the drop in temperature uh, isn't that great. Um, you know, it's still hotter than a summer's day in Europe, um, <laughs> but it does trigger. It can trigger um, infections and croup um, and, 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 and throat infections. Yeah. Now, here in, U in the U.S., there's yeah. been a discussion in the U.S. FDA, Food and Drug Administration, about regulating homeopathy. What are your feelings about regulation, government regulation of homeopathy? When you say regulation, um, I guess this can take several forms. Um, my overall perspective is that regulation is fine, but not regulation when it basically means that you, you don't have access to the things that you want to use. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the campaigns here in Australia has been to stop access to 17 complementary therapies. That's not regulation. That's a blanket ban and making it impossible for people to have freedom of choice in medicine. So, you know, regulation to ensure our medicines are safe, that they're tested, that they're reliable, fine. Let's have more research. Let's catalog, document that, make that available and accessible to the public. Um, but you, you can't just regulate against complementary medicine per se. That's a nonsense. It's like telling us, you know, that we must eat Weetabix for breakfast or, you know, it's, it's, it's stupid. It's not in the interest of public health. And it certainly, um, you know, doesn't help the complementary medicines industry. Now, you are the spokesman for Your Health, Your Choice campaign in Australia. Can you mm. tell our audience more about that campaign? Yes, I, I'd love to share that with you. Um, there's a wonderful movie maker called Laurel Shilton. She's an American based in New York. You may have heard of her. And she spent, she spent nearly 10 years producing a documentary on homeopathy. Because when she first stumbled across it, she didn't know what it was and she became curious. And during those, those 10 years of making the film, in fact, it was on the final cut in the ninth year, she stumbled across a report from the NHMRC, uh, the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia, that had, had concluded that there was no reliable evidence for homeopathic medicine. And this really created another interest because she just spent eight years interviewing homeopaths and, and, and Western medical people and a wide variety of people. And she was quite shocked and very surprised to find that in Australia that this was an outcome of, of, a, of, a, of a study. So, so she started to research that. And within the film, Just One Drop, which um, again, there's a website and you can access, it's been, I think 150, uh, uh, it's been screened in over 120 countries around the world and it's still showing. Um, there is a 10 minute um, excerpt 
purely about the findings of the National Health and Medical Research Council. Now they are the world's gold standard in research. They are here to protect the public, to ensure that the medicines we, we have here in Australia are safe, that they are, um, they've been tested accurately and prescribed effectively. What happened with that, um, their investigation is quite a long-winded process, but I'll cut it very, very short. The Australian Homeopathic Association, myself, Arrow, the registering board were all asked to submit evidence in favor of homeopathy and we submitted somewhere in the region of 1800 reports and research papers. Those research papers um, were examined by an initial committee and that first committee found in favor of homeopathic medicine but that committee was fired and we have asked repeatedly um, to see that report and it's only been offered on the basis that we don't publish it. So I'll let you draw your own conclusion. So a second committee was appointed. The chair of that committee had signed paperwork to suggest that he had no uh, conflict of interest. And in fact, he was head uh, or part of the chair group of Friends of Science in Medicine, which if you're aware of this group, they are no friends of, of complementary medicine. So he was chairing the second inquiry. Then they introduced two new um, levels of um, uh, screening for the research papers we'd submitted, both of which are pretty unheard of in this type of research inquiry. The first was that all the trial groups had to have a group of over 150. And so that excluded, and that number 150 is not used in medical or in scientific circles at all. Some of the medical um, trials that have been done have been on groups as small as 50, and still medicines have made it into the public arena. And the second uh, criteria was to do with a qualitative JDAR scale rating, which had to be a five. And again, no piece of research scores a five, so, or very few do. So it reduced, it reduced our, our papers to, to just three, I think. And of those three, they looked at two. Mm. And the conclusion was, at that point, that... I'm trying to recall their precise words, and it is on the HRI research um, uh, website, that there was insufficient evidence. They went to the Cochrane Institute of Australia, who gave guidance on how to interpret and how to make a statement on what has been um, researched. And Cochrane said, well, you can't say there's not sufficient evidence on the basis of these two papers, um, research studies that you've looked at. You need to go back and look at more or, or, or get more studies, but they didn't. They went forward and they published. There is no reliable evidence to support that homeopathy is effective in any, any situation. And homeopathy is the world's second most widely used medicine. It is widely used. Over three and a half million people in Europe use it. Um, in America too, it has great roots and great history. I've actually seen a photograph of homeopathic physicians on the grass at the... Um, uh, at, at Washington, having a picnic with the president back in 1920. Um, you know, the, the history is huge and we know it works um, and there is reliable research to substantiate that. So it's quite criminal what's happened. So on the back of that, to answer your question, where did Your Health, Your Choice come from? This, the Your Health, Your Choice campaign was launched by a company called Adonai Marketing together with um, Complementary Medicines Association, the CMA of Australia, and the Australian Homeopathic Association. And this was a campaign that was launched last July in Sydney at the inaugural showing of Just, um, Just One Drop. And the role of, of Your Health, Your Choice is to raise public awareness, to show the public here in Australia that if they do not vote with their feet, they will not have a choice in being able to access yoga therapy, Pilates, Bowen therapy, homeopathy, Feldenkrais, Alexander Technique, and the list goes on. And we've raised, I have to check actually, I didn't check this morning, somewhere in the region of 76, 77,000 signatures. We're looking for 100,000, um, and then we will take a march at Canberra, and, well, more importantly, 100,000 is a measure at which the politicians have to 
um, take this seriously and they have to start to look at it. Never mind the cost saving benefits to the ailing health budget that can be um, had by integrating complementary medicine um, alongside other, other therapies. People here in Australia will lose the right to reclaim from their health funds and that's one of the biggest things because at the moment we have private health care. Most um, people that have cover have additional extras and options and they can reclaim their yoga therapy, their Pilates, their homeop homeopathic treatment. If that goes, people are concerned um, that they won't be able to access. The truth of the matter is over the last 18 months, I have never been busier in practice. I have a three or four month waiting list. Um, and this is the same for many, many established practitioners here. Now, Jean, what can people do who are listening who want to protect homeopathy and protect complementary th therapies? What can we do to let our voices be known? Mm. Well, one voice tells another tells another. And, and as you're probably aware, you know, many of our referrals do come through mothers that have been treated who, who tell their friends and their families, patients who tell their husbands, who sometimes reluctantly come for that first consultation, but then recognize that actually these medicines work and there are fewer side effects. The yourhealthyourchoice.com.au website has a, a voting panel for not just Australians, but also for non-Australians, non-residents. And that will make a difference. And in each country, um, there are, I say, similar campaigns. I know the UK, there is heavy petitioning, particularly for, for homeopathy. Um, they have recently tried to remove the right of veterinary surgeons um, in using homeopathic medicine on animals. And we know it works on animals and it works so beautifully, which completely negates any placebo therapy. Well, it's all in your mind, dear. Um, you've had an hour and a half with your homeopath, so you must feel better. Um, I worked with animals and herds of cattle at the time of the foot and mouth outbreak in the UK. And it was quite clear on the map that they produced of South Wales, the farms that had had homeopathic medicine added to their animal uh, waters and feeds. Um, they, they were not the funeral pyres that there were in the other areas. It put a very protective energetic boundary around those farms. Dogs, cats, they all respond very, very similarly. And interestingly, dogs and cats often need a similar remedy to their owner. Um, I'm not legally allowed to treat dogs and cats, so I don't. But patients come on workshops, they learn to prescribe for acute coughs and colds and, and, and skin things. And they may choose themselves to use their remedies on, on their animals and with great success um, and safely. And if you give a wrong remedy, there's no resonance, it doesn't do any harm. There is no way um, uh, that, that, that you can harm anyone with homeopathy. Now, going back to what we can do, so if people go to yourhealthyourchoice.com.au, there's places where people can sign a petition, correct? Absolutely correct. And find out more information about what's happening here in Australia, but also globally. That's, that's so important. Now, um, and I love what you were saying about how your, your dog or your cat frequently needs the same remedies that you do. Here in Atlanta, a young woman had just bought an aura camera. And last week she took uh, my aura picture, which was really interesting. And then she had a plate where you could place the paws of my dog. So she also took a picture of my dog and my dog and I have the same aura photo. Wow. <laughs> well, it's an energy field. It's, it's like mum and child. You remain in that energetic field, basically. Yeah. So it makes total sense. Yeah. Now, if, if people in our audience are listening and they're interested in finding a good homeopath, what are some of the things that someone should look for when they're trying to find a good homeopath, someone who's highly trained and who can really help them? In each country, there are different um, registering and um, uh, homeopathic associations. So in the UK, it's the Society of Homeopaths and the, the Alliance of Registered Homeopaths. 
both of those are the two main registering bodies for homeopaths like myself that have not had a full medical training. If you've trained as a, a doctor and you've moved into homeopathic medicine, you in the UK you'll be on the British Homeopathic Association um, website. So that's three websites within the UK. You need to look for people that have registered qualifications and each country has its own registering boards that are acknowledged. In Australia, it's ARO, A-R-O-H, um, and the Australian Homeopathic Association is, is one of the largest memberships for, for homeopaths here. But again, the medical fraternity, who are also homeopaths, will be on a different board. You also need to, um, yeah, you need to make contact and find somebody that you feel easy talking to about your health. It's not a question of just pitching up with a list of your symptoms and saying, give me a remedy. You have to feel comfortable um, and develop you know, a level of, of inherent trust um, in that person. And that comes through getting to know someone. So many homeopaths will offer a 10 or 15 minute complimentary session just to get to know me, to talk generally. But the experience is the main thing. Um, referrals are obviously useful. We're not allowed to publish testimonials anymore. We're not allowed to say what remedies do what either. Um, so there's an awful lot that we can't do, but what we can do <laughs> is encourage people um, to talk about their experiences and, 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 and share what homeopathic medicine and complementary medicine has done to help their health. Finding homeopaths is still easy. Um, if they close down the registering boards and deregulate us, um, because that's the other way things could go ultimately, then it'll be harder. But you know, we'll call ourselves smartier paths or something else paths. And, <laughs> and through the wonders of modern technology, social media, internet, Facebook, people only have to put a name in or the word homeopathy and things come up. It's, it's much, much easier than it was, say, 20, 30 years ago, pre, uh, pre-internet. Um, I know here in Atlanta, my naturopath uh, mm. prescribes and recommends homeopathy. So mm. when I go to her, you know, she'll recommend a course of treatment and it's usually homeopathy and herbs. And it's my observation as a medical intuitive that many people actually do better with vibrational remedies than they do certainly with medication, prescribed medication, mm. but also even from natural supplements. Mm. What is your observation about that where people sometimes do better with vibrational remedies. Vibrational remedies really work at the core and the very essence of the individual. So they get to the root and the cause of the disease, of the disturbance, of the disruption to the vital force. Whereas, um, you know, herbal medications can be wonderful, so can nutritional supplementation. But again, it can be a band-aid, it can be a cover-up. Um, and, you know, if they have to be taken over long periods of time, then there's something that still isn't operating well within the integrity of the human body field. So we need to correct the messaging. Um, if somebody is not absorbing iron, yes, you can give iron supplements so your cows come home. You can give um, all manner of herbs and things to encourage the uptake. But if still the iron is, is not in increasing, then that's just a, a complete waste and can be very expensive. What homeopathy does, it goes into the root and the core and it changes the susceptibility and the ability of the body to absorb nutrition, to, to correct pathways. Um, you know, I have people who come and who may have been put on antidepressants I always work alongside their GP if they choose to come off them. But first up, we work with homeopathy to address, well, what was there before, before you took the antidepressant? What was that anxiety about? When did it commence? Was there a life event at which point you clicked into this particular state and got stuck? And we go back and try to, to undo the glue that has stuck the person in that pattern of thinking and, and response to their environment. So it's about trying to get to the core, the very essence of vitality, um, and to correct that safely, gently, and permanently. And those are three words, again, we're not supposed to use, but I guess I'm on a global forum, so that's all right, sort of. <laughs> but that's what I love about energetic medicine. It makes the permanent changes. 
Um, and it makes, it can be so subtle, so subtle. And it's not until, um, you know, the patient comes back and, and they ask about certain things that were presenting a, a month or so ago. And they say, really, did I have that? How can that be so? How interesting. Oh yes, and my husband, he's noticed a difference in me. And my colleagues at work, I'm less snappish and I don't go off on one every time, you know, the coffee machine doesn't work. Um, not that most of my patients do drink coffee either. E energetically, it's not good for many of them. So um, <laughs> not a good illustration perhaps. But yeah, so energy medicine gets to the vitality. It corrects. It's a bit like um, we've often likened, you know, life. We come into life. We're born pure um, and almost like, do you remember those old uh, vinyl records? <laughs> They play music. They play music because there's grooves in them. Well, we come in pure into this world, uh, but we do have grooves. We have ancestral stuff. We have parents and grandparents, history of health and history of emotional responses. And we know through epigenetics now that I think they've tested sperm of one man and his grandfather that was in the war and there's trauma that's being picked up. So there's some very interesting research that's taking place and we come in and then we start to sing our own song and we respond to the environment from a health perspective and from um, a social perspective and many other things. And that gives an imprint. And this record plays and we integrate and we grow up. And then at a point in life, sometimes that song needs to change. And it could be a life event. It could be a death. It could be a changing career. There could be something that happens to us and we recognize that perhaps our path and our journey has not been the most healthy. And that's why we get sore throats every week and we can't speak every month. Well, that's why we're getting this. There's often a causational link between the physical symptoms and the mental and emotional status of a patient. Um, and that's where energy medicine comes in. It doesn't just do, fix up the sore throat. It fixes up, well, why is it happening month in, month out? What else is going on? that is contributing to this vital disturbance in this individual. And then there is harmony. And it's not a cacophony of noise. There is this beautiful harmony. And a person's life flows. And they move through life with ease and grace, physically, emotionally. And it's like a beautiful flowing river or an orchestra that's fully tuned or a piece of music or a dance or something that just feels perfect and completely integrated in its own right. And that's a big ask, but that's what we try to do with homeopathy. <laughs> so Jane Lindsay of Brisbane, Australia, from, from your perspective, how has the practice of homeopathy evolved over the past decades? Homeopathy has, has really gone in um, cycles. Um, it's always gone through places of... Um, being very well accepted, very well understood, and widely recognized. 150 years ago in the UK, there were 150 homeo homeopathic hospitals, many of them small cottage hospitals, but they administered homeopathic medicines. Today, there's one integrated um, complementary medicine hospital in London that up until five years ago was the London Homeopathic Hospital. Um, so, and we know looking globally, here in Australia, there were four homeopathic hospitals, two of them in Tasmania, which is one of the islands off Australia, one in Hobart and one in Launceston. Widely known, widely accepted. And then we saw at the turn of the um, 20th century, the advent of pharmaceutical medicine. Prior to then, all physicians relied either on leaching giving highly toxic substances like arsenic or perhaps mercury to cure syphilis. They do the bloodletting um, with the leeches. They might amputate, but without anesthetic and, and, and certainly without any, any antiseptic. So the role of a physician was really quite different and they relied on herbs and local medicine and homeopathy. I have a beautiful kit that was handed to me from a missionary that worked out in um, the Solomon Islands. That's a project I've been involved in. And indeed there, they have a 150 year legacy of, of homeopathic medicine. And this kit belonged to a doctor who was based in London, but worked predominantly in South America for many, many years. And then he passed the kit over. 
So there was a time where homeopathy was really first medicine and was recognized widely across the world. And then it went into a bit of a dip and then it re-emerges and then it gets squashed and then it re-emerges. And yes, there are global threats um, designed to perhaps, you know, suppress or, or destroy homeopathy. But it's really just a noise in the background. And yes, it's got a bit louder recently, but it'll go away and we'll see the resurgence of, of homeopathy. Um, here in Australia, our biggest concern is the removal of the homeopathic degree courses from the colleges. And until we have that NHMRC report overturned, um, there's very little formal four-year training here for homeopaths. It's only, it's only being offered as part of a naturopathic degree, which is not quite the same as, as a pure homeopathic degree. But there are other courses and one can study overseas. Um, and India isn't so far from, from um, Australia. So there's much we can do. And people like myself that have been homeopaths for a long time, we're also supporting, mentoring students who have come through and who are setting up in practice. Now, Jane Lindsay, how do you see the future of complementary medicine going in Australia as well as worldwide? Here in Australia, as we've discussed, um, complementary medicine has been under the spotlight and under the banner, but uh, people vote with their feet. Um, the threat of removing these things from health funds actually has made very little difference because people would rather not have their health fund and just pay for the services that they require and that they believe will best support their health. So that is kind of backfiring on, on, on what the government expected, that more people would uptake the private health funds. The way I see it is people are very dissatisfied, not just um, here, but globally with conventional medicine. It does not have all the answers. There are many, you know, life supporting um, pharmaceutical drugs that are absolutely totally essential to, to people's lives. But there are other situations where complementary medicine can be very, very effective um, and support the individual. You know, take, for example, well, we've discussed ear infections. You know, there's so many things. Uh, I guess here I'm seeing more and more children being diagnosed with ADHD. And the only recourse really here is to be put on to, 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 to various drugs that suppress that, that's cha that child's outward expression. Um, and yes, it's exaggerated in ADHD. They can't sit still. They, they have learning issues. They may have toileting issues. They may have sleep issues and other behavioral things going on. And for a child to be medicated at age seven, um, and quite heavily medicated in a very suppressive way, inherently for many parents feels very wrong. And then they come and they look for support. And there are many approaches, not just homeopathy, that will help a child with ADHD reach their full potential and possibly even grow out of that over time. Um, but it requires you know, a lot of thought and, uh, and a lot of experienced practitioners working together to, to, to support those cases. So complementary medicine, I mean, more and more people are talking about it. Yoga, Pilates, all this comes under the banner of complementary medicine. Feldenkrais, um, Alexander Technique. And it's not just for the new age hippie people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s are doing yoga and getting benefit from it. Um, so there's a much broader understanding and awareness that the responsibility of one's health is with the individual and we should have that individual freedom of choice to choose what suits us um, and what suits us as, as an individual. So the future of complementary medicine here in Australia is bright. I, I see it expanding. It has been expanding over the last few years. If you read the wellbeing reports, um, I don't have those stats in front of me, but it's increasing year on year exponentially. And that will continue as people seek alternatives to routine antibiotics and routine medications. That's not to say that there isn't a place for, for Western medicine, but um, many things have been overused, overprescribed, and the interaction between some of those drugs is not fully appreciated either. And in fact, the University of Sheffield just published in the UK a report on those drug interactions and the number of deaths 
and uh, serious cases that have resulted as a result of um, multi, multi medicines and not really fully understanding the outcome of that. Yeah, one of the recommendations, piece, one of the pieces of advice that I give all of my clients who are on more than one drug. Uh, first of all, if you're on any one drug, there's a website called rxlist.com, and you can mm. look up the side effects of that one drug. However, as Jane Lindsay mentioned, if you're on more than one drug, nobody's, a lot of times the doctors are not thinking about how all your medications are interacting. But there's a wonderful website called epocrates.com, and you can plug in all the drugs you're taking and look at the medical research about how those are interacting. So Jane Lindsay, final thoughts. If there was a message that you could give the world about homeopathy, what would you want to tell everyone? I would initially say, Aure sapere, and people will say, what? It was a phrase Hahnemann used. It's my business name, and it means dare to think for yourself. <laughs> do not be led by a lemming over the cliff. Get out there, do your own research, find practitioners that you resonate with, um, get exercise, eat well, have pure clean water, and do what, do what does you well to survive and thrive. Life's good and it's fun, but it's for you not to be permanently um, yeah, supported by um, government rhetoric, basically. You've been listening to Jane Lindsay. She is a homeop homeopath in Brisbane, Australia. You can find out more about her and her wonderful work at janelindsay.com.au and your healthy choice, your health, yourchoice.com au while you're there sign the petition and you've been listening to me Catherine Kerrigan a medical intuitive healer Amazon number one best-selling author and you can find out more about me at katherinekerrigan.com while you're there sign up for my newsletter so that you can learn more about how you can heal yourself naturally and as Jane Lindsay said one of the first steps to take advantage of complementary medicine and homeopathy is to dare to think for yourself. When you dare to think for yourself, you can take advantage of natural healing. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time.